Hello, everybody, and welcome to the last um, and final um, lecture in our series um, for this academic year. Um, we're very glad that you all joined us, um, and we're very pleased um, to tell you a little bit about um, our distinguished lecture series from 2021-22, Emergent Care and Community. My name is Christina Baines. I'm the co-chair of the board of the New York Academy of Sciences. And for this um, academic year, we've, we've been very um, pleased to welcome um, um, distinguished lecturers from around the world um, to deal with um, this theme, emergent care and community. In the wake of our turbulent and abiding experiences of pandemic pain and politics, the anthropology section of the New York Academy of Sciences focuses our 2021-22 program on theory and critique of forms of care, mutual aid, and charity. Um, with this theme, we raise questions about the possibility and solidarity in the face of entrenched social inequalities and racialized structural violence. With this theme, we honor um, our esteemed colleagues from our New York community who we recently lost, David Graeber, Sally Engelmary, Leif Mullings, and Paul Farmer. We invite discussion of how communities develop and deepen forms of care for one another and our environment in times of crisis or under enduring conditions of suffering. How might care be reactive, adaptive, relative, or revelatory? How do emergent communities, both on the ground and in virtual spaces, stake claims to the future that expands or contracts the space of solidarity? This conversation invites discussion of the politics of humanitarian efforts throughout the world in recognition of the reality that much community-based care emerges in the shadow of dysfunctional governance and the corruptions of neoliberalism. The global pandemic has highlighted the irony that care workers are often underpaid or even unpaid, their exploitation a symptom of structural inequalities accrued across generations. Against the centrifugal forces of capitalist modernity, what possibilities exist for radical mutuality in the future? What constitutes care as related to the social, environmental, ontological, or material? Rather than asking anthropologists to assume some kind of prophetic role, this series offers an opportunity to take critical stock of what tools and perspectives our discipline provides in terms of methods, theory, community engagement, and public commentary as we envision and imagine new possibilities um, for reshaping society. And with that statement of our emergent care and community theme, we're very pleased today um, to welcome Merav Shohet. Merav is an assistant professor of anthropology at Boston University. Her work integrates psychological, medical, and linguistic anthropology to examine care, affect, ethics, and gender in relation to kinship, narrative, eating disorders, and the end of life in Vietnam and North America. She's author of Silence and Sacrifice, Family Stories of Care and the Limits of Love in Vietnam um, from the University of California Press in 2021, congratulations. And she has published articles on related topics in American Anthropologist, American Ethnologist, Ethos, Transcultural Psychiatry, and the Journal of the Royal Anthropological Institute, among others. Two of her current projects include an SSRC funded study of stigma syndemics and end-stage kidney disease in disenfranchised Boston area communities fighting COVID-19, and a longitudinal study of practices of elder care and inequality in Israel's transforming um, kibbutzism. And our discussant who will be um, commenting on Merav's work um, after her lecture um, in his, uh, we welcome Zhao Wheel in his ethnographic and historical work. He explores how people, um, people's classes plasticity and environmental attunements disrupt and exceed dominant ways of knowing and acting, thus opening new vistas for storytelling and critical theory. As he dissects past and current regimes of, of power and knowledge, Beal considers the array of human and non-human alignments, affects, ideas, technologies, and forces that shape survival in the context of stark inequality and living together in frontier zones. In attending to insurgent archivings and advancing of anthropology of becomings, Beale's work seeks to restore a sense of wonder and movement to ethical and political debates and to creative expression. 
So with those um, introductions, we welcome Mara Shohat to take the stage, and I couldn't imagine a, a, a better um, closeout to our Distinguished Lecture Series. Thank you and welcome. So um, thank you all. I'm, I'm really honored that, um, that to have been invited. I, I wanna thank Christina Baines and also Stephanie Rupp who's not here today and uh, Baird Campbell for organizing this event and um, for inviting me. And I'm exceedingly thrilled and honored to be in conversation with Dr. Joao Beal. And I'm especially looking forward to the questions from the audience. It's really nice to see so many familiar and also unfamiliar uh, faces here. So um, thank you for coming. Thank you for tuning in. And I guess I'll just jump right in. Um, so I'll share the screen a second. So I have essentially one takeaway for tonight, which is to de-romanticize care and community, but also not to give up on these as an aspiration for, most for a more just world in the face of violence, illness, and inequity. And I think we can do this, first of all, by acknowledging how we are connected and entangled with and obligated to others at multiple scales. This is an existential condition, inseparable from our being in this world. My focus will mostly be on the microdynamics of entanglement, but I invite us to think beyond the local case that I present. I also want to start by acknowledging the rippling effects of the pandemic and the longstanding structures of inequality. Um, and of course, we've all been challenged by illness, closures, the loss of loved ones, or by altered ways of being in the world. Racialized and poor Americans, and of course, many, many others in the global South and beyond suffer most, and sadly, these continue to be troubled times. Saturday's mass shooting and the ongoing conflicts in Ukraine, Syria, Yemen, Palestine, Israel, and so many other places bring into relief who gets seen, assaulted, remembered, and cared for and about. Faced with a pandemic and pervasive, seemingly intractable inequalities and inequities in the US and beyond, we can't help but wish to study and find new ways of imagining and enacting care in our communities. Some of my most recent work has indeed turned to this in collaboration with Dr. Insa Schmidt of Boston Med University Medical School. Together, we've been researching how stigmatized and racial, racialized end-stage kidney disease patients in one of Boston's safety net hospitals are syndemically affected, meaning exponentially harmed by the pandemic in conjunction with their already structurally precarious positions. One of the things that has captivated my attention has been the ways in which many patients experience the pandemic, not so much as a rupture, but as continuity. Caring for and by kin and friends, some have found ways not only to make life bearable, but strive to flourish. They do so by prioritizing contact and connections with their social networks, especially intimate kin and friends, sometimes somewhat at the expense of public health guidelines. As well, they narratively privilege chronicity of their condition over its looming terminality and find constancy, solace, and hope in their faith in God and church communities on this earth and in the afterlife. But this in no way alleviates exacerbated structural conditions that continue to assault racialized patients. And it does point though to the ways in which community and a sense of continuity can matter quite a bit in times of crisis and in the face of chronic trouble. But rather than focus on this ongoing research, tonight I instead want to take us to Vietnam to highlight how care emerges as a central facet of life there, and also to invite us to think how this applies here. Long before the pandemic in the mid 2000s, I came to Vietnam to try to understand how families who had been split up since the 1950s by the nation's anti-colonial and anti-imperial wars and by Vietnam's related civil war, came to reunite since the 1980s and make life together possible. I situated the study in central Vietnam as a site of conflict and rapid social change. As you might know, within two decades of reunification, 
communist Vietnam embraced a series of reforms known as Doi Mai that increasingly marketized and liberalized its economy. By 2007, Vietnam had adopted market socialism and entered the World Trade Organization. I draw on my recent book tonight, Silence and Sacrifice, to expose some of the complexities of care, love, and community. I begin by briefly introducing the structure and some of the basic concepts of my book and follow that with some excerpts from chapter four. The first three chapters illustrate three basic principles that I'm working with, sacrifice, asymmetrical reciprocity, and the gap. These work like the grammar of a language in a sense to structure and organize life experiences of the people I worked with, but of course in non-uniform ways. And then the second part of the book continues to emphasize complications on the ground, as I feature protagonists who had more tenuous connections to the state and ghosts from the past haunting them at times. Together, all these chapters show that ethical personhood is relational and contextual. We have to take account of someone's gender, life course, class, and national politics to understand them. And we can't simply talk about the ethical person or the moral communities in general. My research was mostly based in the bustling central Vietnam city of Da Nang and its neighboring rural province of Wang Nam between 2002 and 2008. It involved deep immersion in the lives of several related and unrelated families in the city, its organizing periphery and nearby villages. And my methods included um, primarily participant observations, also household uh, surveys, focal follows with five extended families, particularly the relation between um, parents and other caregivers and children, and open-ended and person-centered interviews which led to what I call a family-centered ethnography. Um, and, um, and, and of course, I used a lot of photographs and video recordings to also attend to patterns of speech and, and the ways that interaction is, is really quite embodied and, and not just flat. And so this meant following family members across all events from celebrations and funerals to village festivals, weddings, and daily life such as going to the market and child weaning. It also meant following public health and morality campaigns and related propaganda. I didn't originally mean to study silence and sacrifice, but in trying to understand what holds families together, um, who had been torn by wars and all the subsequent changes in Vietnam, I came to see these as key components. I constantly read about or heard invoked the concepts of he sen and think am when learning Vietnamese and talking to people, whereas people never talked about trauma. And because I didn't wanna pry or impose my concepts onto them, I decided to focus on the role of he sen, which I sacrifice and think am, which I loosely translate as care, um, in people's lives as a way in, and also to answer the question of what it means to be a virtuous person in times of upheaval and change. In Vietnam's Doi Mai, a renovation market economy, where nationalized forms of care are increasingly absent, I found that young, especially poor women, and in Da Nang, those affiliated with the losing side of the American war, shoulder a disproportionate burden. This is because market forces reify gendered cultural norms and saddle them with a work of care. And this involves my third key concept, asymmetrical reciprocity. This is an edict term that I developed to make sense of the relations of care and forms of exchange that, continue, that I continually observed in the field and which I later thought also apply here in America but in much more muted ways. It has to do with how people are always in relations of obligations with each other in rather Mausian ways. And it's crystallized by the common Vietnamese saying that people must respect those above and yield to those below them. Throughout the book, I show how these are gendered but not just differentiated in terms of men sacrificing and women loving and taking care as we might think of it in Western terms. 
In anthropology, we've tended to theorize sacrifice as a blood-filled religious ritual, which he sin is not in Vietnamese, or as a patriotic act, which he sin very much is in Vietnam, the sacrifice of soldiers in war. But what we've ignored in our theories are the seemingly mundane and personal forms of sacrifice in daily life. In chapter one of my book, I expand on the different scales of sacrifice, from patriotic death to suffering to sustain the home front during the war, to the ways that these are entangled with personal suffering, silence, and sacrifice. I recount in that chapter the case of a man from Wang Nam who was imprisoned and tortured by the French prior to Vietnam's split, and then sent um, and then he spent years fighting to liberate the South. For decades, he was separated from his natal family. Soon after marrying a wife in the North, he was recruited to join the war front in his natal province in the South, leaving her, um, leaving her pregnant and alone for over a decade. I trace in the chapter how Tan's narrative aligns with Vietnam's broader national history. Um, where he seemingly mimics the propagandistic slogans of the times that Vietnam is one and nothing is more valuable than independence. But these slogans also have deep meanings for Tan, the soldier, fearing for his life and missing his mother and wife. As the story unfolds, we see how Tan minimizes his own past suffering and instead highlights his wife's and especially his mother's pain. This is part of the silence of sacrifice. The next two chapters show how asymmetrical reciprocity and think am work as organizing principles in life. These structure people's experiences of time across Vietnam's two calendars and relations with the ancestors, with the state, and with each other. Among other things, I show how communist state efforts to legislate gender equality have worked instead to engender difference by naturalizing gender, class, and other hierarchies. These rely on unequal, but presumably benevolent, bidirectional care. The second half of my book, and what I wanna to shift to now, troubles the principles of morality and ethics, care, sacrifice, and asymmetrical reciprocity, especially when we study them in practice. Here, it's important to look at families in terms of multiple members and their different, dynamic, intersectional perspectives and grievances. And this is where we see how Think Am gets weaponized as kin moralize and criticize one another, and more silently, the state, which I won't get to tonight. To make con concrete what I mean by weaponization of care, not just by humanitarian or state efforts, which I don't focus on in the book, but by intimates themselves, I'd like now to turn to excerpts from chapter four of my book, Waiting as Care. First though, I highlight three other concepts that will be useful in making sense of the stories that I tell. These are, the, these, these are three genres of, or framings of narrative, foreshadowing, backshadowing, and sideshadowing. Note the narratives are not confined to written texts. Narratives are embodied and come alive in the messiness of interaction. You're probably all familiar with foreshadowing narratives where we see past events as foretelling future ones. These are typically found in narratives of progress and modernity, which rely on the standard literary device of foreshadowing, where writers plant omens to key us to future happenings. So for example, it was a dark and stormy night and we know what the, the next sequence is gonna be. Backshadowing narratives operate by the same reverse logic. We judge past actions in terms of the present as though those conditions already were and should have been known in the past. So for example, people blame Holocaust victims for not having seen the writing on the wall and marching to their death like sheep to the slaughter. Both foreshadowing and backshadowing narrative practices rely on linear, morally consistent plots. By contrast, sideshadowing narratives are those that highlight contingency, ambiguity, and contradiction. They're not so linear and instead can foreground the doubt, uncertainty, and ambivalence of people's lived experiences. 
we can find all three narrative practices in people's lives, but in different contexts and degrees. Let me now show how this plays out in the lives of Vietnamese families as they continually had to navigate present concerns with health and wealth, colored both by the long shadow of wartime when their loyalties were split and by the present transition to, the, to market socialism of Dai Moi. What I wanna show here are some of the impossibilities of privatization. Even, um, sorry, even under neoliberalism, using a linguistic anthropological and critical phenomenological lens to highlight micro instances of care. I focus on the moral rather than political ecology of marketizing socialist Vietnam to show some of the ambivalences and complexities involved in care and how there is no safe haven where all is always good and right. This leads me to bridge a debate in the anthropology of ethics and morality on whether ethics is primarily an imminent ordinary practice or if it requires a moment of breakdown that forces us to stop and reflect and only then act to remake our world. I begin with two premises. First, in focusing on individuals who care, I assume not the rightfully maligned, autonomous, bounded, self-interested persons, the theorists attribute to Western or even neoliberal subjects, but relational and evaluative subjects whose ethics come to the foreground when we attend to their living narratives of everyday interactions. These narratives are not texts. They unfold as people talk and interact with one another in their daily life. Family caregivers' attempts to provide Carol show can be fraught with moral peril and filled with ambivalent silences that threaten to unravel relations in late reform Vietnam. Any harmony, continuity, or even what we might consider the ordinary do not come ready-made. They're effortfully achieved and precariously sustained. My second assumption is that end-of-life care requires competence. Caregivers try to, give, to keep the dying both alive and comfortable. And yet competence or incompetence is at once imminent, since we can become competent or incompetent at any moment. It's impending. And competence is also imminent. It's inherent in any social interaction. Throughout fieldwork, I was trying to tease out what it means to act as and to be a competent ethical person in Da Nang. In chapter two of my book, I relate seemingly simple politeness routines to ancestral worship rituals. As I discovered with child rearing and language socialization, routine acts and rituals subjectivate or teach children and adults to embody a morality of sacrifice and think out. In learning language, children learn how to act, feel, and be Vietnamese, and their caregivers also learn their roles precisely in these interactions. In this video that I'll show in a minute, we see how the mother is insisting that the toddler perform respect to the neighbors, and she corrects her pretty forcefully with her hands and words, but also in a very gentle and yielding manner. <laughs> Not just that politeness is important, but that also the, um, the, they're really explaining which values matter 
and how to do things right. And the mother, daughter, and the neighbors are internalizing being constantly surrounded by a watchful audience that judges them as moral beings and holds them accountable to pay respect above, but also to yield to those below, which is why we see the mom being both harsh, but also very gentle. This is part of being sacrificing beings in their community. And it later translates to similar forms of corporeal sacrifice to the ancestors, which the, the low bow of, of the child was mimicking. So I learned um, the same happens in end of life care. Acts are never unitary or private. They involve a range of asymmetrical forms of reciprocity that reinforce hierarchies. I'll focus on one instance and the stories that surround it. Note that unlike in North America, where care is highly technologized and takes place mostly in biomedical settings, in Da Nang, care was mostly given at home, provided by kin in the midst of their ritual and income earning activities. I learned this from the case of 75-year-old Badai, who started complaining to me quietly of headaches in April and suffered a minor stroke in July. After weeks in the hospital, she returned home and suffered another stroke that left her in a permanent vegetative state in a coma. Waiting for Bear to die at some unknown time in the future, her family shrouded the calamity in silence. Bear's husband, Ambai, coped by sleeping a lot and saying little. The family's women stepped in to fill the vacuum, managing loss with material acts of caregiving. Bear spent several months hooked up to machines in the hospital, but in the face of mounting costs, she returned home in December. She lay on a bed placed in the living room, tended by her daughters and daughters-in-law. From just a minute of footage that I filmed in January, about a month after Bear returned home, we can see a drama unfold that illustrates how kin display their care for the dying. In waiting and caring, they apprentice ethical personhood. This emergent moral socialization routine begins with Ba lying in the bed in the living room, her knees locked upright. Her daughter-in-law, Lan, pleads with a comatose elder to straighten out her legs. And I should just note that this is a bit painful to watch and it was something that I wasn't initially comfortable filming, but the family really wanted me as part of the research of documenting their everyday life and caring. Um, they said, why aren't you filming this? And so I did um, film some of it. And so Am, um, who's come to watch, uses the non-deferential second personal pronoun, me, which only status seniors use towards status juniors, to establish hierarchy as he calls out to Lan till she looks up at him, only to tell her to get back to straighten out her legs. With a smile, Lan answers in a plaintive voice. She keeps grimacing, she then adds. This morning I was able to stretch her a bit, but she's really struggling. Doesn't matter, um, mothers. Um, but, um, but Lan continues with, with her complaint. Actually, she's mad at me, I'm hurting her terribly. Approaching the bed, um, mothers, Dow, it hurts, and then gazes at his wife as Lan continues to walk on Dow's legs. Bending over it to clear the dress there, um, states in an authoritative, paternalistic voice, doesn't hurt. Bending even closer, he exhorts Bear in a scolding voice, endure the pain, stretch out the legs, why stay cramped up? His eyes focusing on Bear, he then adds in a gentler, quieter voice, raising and lowering his chin in a kind of entreaty, stretch out, stretch out. Throughout, Lan continues to, to gently press on her mother-in-law's legs, working to make Bear cooperate with Am's, with Am's command. She overlaps with him, protesting quietly. I tried doing that, while Am's sister-in-law adds her own directive. Stretch out her legs, let her legs lie on the bed. And I'll just show this again. <laughs> 
Adopting Goffman's model of participant roles, we see how the two generations organize their interaction in gendered and age graded ways. It's the daughter in law, Lan, who physically takes care of the ill woman, Ba, while the seniors direct her to keep doing what she has, in fact, been attempting to do. Lan, in turn, has little recourse than to smile, comply, and only weakly protest that she has been doing as told. We learn even more about responsibility, morality, and power if we consider the ecology of this micro interaction. This includes participants' eye gaze, movements, and bodily use of space, which reveal who is interpolated as a ratified participant and how. From this perspective, the exchange looks less harsh. It exemplifies acts of care. Despite, despite Baz's grave condition, her incompetent caregivers treat her as a ratified participant. She is someone to whom they attribute a will, emotions, and agency. Um, scolds, Len, pleads, and imagines or experiences being scolded. And in contrast with those who are not there daily to attend Baz, they at times address her directly, not just as a mostly, but not yet, dead body. In Schutz's sense, they enact a we relationship with Ba. They treat her not as a soon-to-be predecessor, someone who shares neither the same temporal nor spatial frame with them, but as a consociate, someone with whom they could still grow older together. They know that Ba cannot respond either verbally or with her body, yet Amin Lan read her knotted brow and stiff limbs as expressions of pain and stubborn reproof. They treat her, in other words, as still endowed with a rich cognitive life, even though she is motionless, essentially unresponsive, and on the verge of death. They care. In this incipient narrative, Am's exhortation to stretch out models for Lan how to act in a difficult and morally fraught instance where the daughter-in-law is afraid to hurt and earn the wrath of her mother-in-law. In addressing Ba, um, indirectly encourages Lan to keep on tending to the old woman, not to allow Ba's limbs to stiffen and suffer even more. This is an interpersonal form of care that does not explicitly implicate the market. Though privately done at home in passing, it's a public act that demands recognition and repetition. But Lan and Am um, were not professional end of life caregivers. They struggle to make Ba comfortable and to manage their own discomfort. Most days, they did so in muted ways, Lam smiling and Am um, sleeping in the face of Ba's illness. In the absence of prescribed rituals, which are in place for tending and honoring the dead, they worked instead at treating with respect and care this matriarch who for so long had herself managed the smooth running of the household. They interpolated not just each other, but also the comatose Ba as capable of moral action, as eminently competent and yet eminently incompetent beings who are engaged in an ethical project of care for and about one another. This is why the interaction seems so fraught, I think. We see unequally positioned family members deliberate through fleeting action over what the best good in Cheryl Mattingly's terms is for the nearly dead. They seem to act in unison, in agreement that even though stretching out Baz's legs causes the inert but recalcitrant body and the person inhabiting it pain, because she is still a living person, they have to enjoin that to endure pain and act ethically in this world. And yet this version of care and ethical personhood was precarious. Performed daily in Ba's house till her eventual death in spring 2008, it enlisted a range of Ba's relatives who visited periodically and spoke to and about her. And here we see her in the, middle, in the side of the living room. Um, okay. 
So as they continued to participate in the household's rituals, no one projected Ba into the future as an ancestor and no one mentioned her imminent death. They oriented to her only as present and suffering somewhat indignantly. I could end by concluding that these occasions like Ba's earlier quiet endurance of pain where for months she did not seek care for her high blood pressure, reflect local understandings of, gen of gendered virtuous care and daily sacrifice, demanded by an economy of retroacting state care. But the story doesn't end here. Not everyone regarded Am and Ba as innocent victims. Am and Ba's niece, Anne, for example, surprised me one December day with a story of past wrongs and transgressions. I briefly tell this story and the imminent critique that Ba's current state led Anne to project, both to show how protagonists are not all equally burdened with the ethical world of enduring suffering for the sake of another silently, and how fragile love and care can be under both marketization and socialism. Decades earlier, Am's brothers fought on opposing sides of the American war. And yet the siblings always seemed tight-knit. They kept past divisions mute. They liked to recount how Am had done right by his youngest brother, Sin, raising him and ensuring his education since their father died young in 1948. These were compact, coherent striving narratives with clear beginnings and morally predictable endings. But there is another side-shadowing genre of narratives these stories highlight ambiguity, ambivalence, and contradiction. Co-narrated and non-linear, they invite moral reflection and debate. In Anne's meandering story, Am and his wife appear as withholding or suspending care during and after the war. Anne narrates this tale of wrongs indirectly. It's a side-shadowing story told non-linearly by weaving back and forth through time, emphasizing moments of connection, love, and hurt. And here I have a kinship chart just because there is a bunch of um, characters that are being invoked. And so just to, to help us um, situate who is who. And so Amon Ba had not risked losing their house for sheltering their American collaborating brother Sin nor had they helped his, face, his faithful wife, Mo, visit him in communist re-education camp, like Am's sister and Anne's mother, B had done. Am and Ba's passive acts of omission of care, which remained implicit and unnarrated, also turned into sinful commission when Am sold off lands that jointly belonged to all his siblings. He left Sin's children nothing. The threads of the story are tangled, narrating shifting, shifting affective stances, oblique connections, and disagreements that are not resolved. In side-shadowing fashion, Anne presents a series of contested moral stances as protagonists hold conflicting commitments to their kin. She grieves for her, for her now deceased Uncle Sin's wife, Mo, who died after the couple left Vietnam. But when Anne was upset at Sin for remarrying, her mother B defended him and scolded Anne. Blood ties or loyalty to Sin trump friendship and connection with Ma. Anne's story continually descends into the past and navigates a present seemingly blindly without the full clarity of hindsight. It relies on silences and absences, not saying that, uh, that Am had not cared for his mother, but pointing how his sister had, she tells me. Siblings love, they take care of each other. They don't care about whatever happens. They don't care about money. And yet Anne's story is filled with instances in which gifts of money stood for acts of love and refusal to give was equated with betrayal. Contradiction pervades her stories and still one point emerges clearly at the end. When Anne's mother B takes over the telling, Land prices soared, but Am and his wife barely shared profits from the sale of their grandparents' land and refused her even the smallest of loans. They didn't care. Here, B and Anne use backshadowing, using present hindsight to morally assess past deeds to link Ba's present state to recent and past wrongs. 
their story, which gained steam only slowly, suddenly crescendoed to its conclusion. The present suffering was karmic retribution for a life that could have been led otherwise. Her voice quietly furious, B says, I only asked for 20 bucks. I asked for so little, but I didn't give it. This was recent, before Babai got sick. Um said he didn't have it, fuck. We yield to him whatever he wants. Mother and daughter abruptly stopped the account with B's unexpected curse. Resentments over care withheld or inadequately performed, which could lie dormant for decades, came to the surface with Baz's present illness. This occasioned imminent reflection over how to care and imminent judgments about who is competent or, who, or incompetent at doing so. Tensions subtly expressed in instances such as when Baz's legs need to be straightened incite caregivers to reflect on who has cared and who deserves caring. A linguistic phenomenological lens reveals how temporal horizons reach into the past and future, both in Anne's and B's backshadowing and sideshadowing stories that frame past expectations and promises unfulfilled as foregone conclusions or as unexpected turns. In Lan and Am's incipient and acted narrative, Ethical figures take shape through complaints, exhortations, and silences. These stories and silences color present concerns over care, condense in Baz's figure, lying on her bed in the living room, unconscious and unrestful. These not only sustain, but also threaten to rupture shared understandings of who is or was virtuous and why forcing and forging an ethics not of cool judgment, but rife with cascading affects of love and regret. These emotions, I want to emphasize, are spawned in intersubjective relations and pervade ethics. And still, rapture was kept at bay. Anne and B continued to visit there, effectively refusing to jeopardize rituals of care and dominant narratives of virtue, despite some tensions. Their stories where scornful language erupts remained almost exclusively silenced. I conclude then that by tracing the unfolding implotments and intersections of Am's, Anne's, and B's stories, we can witness how precarious the work of enduring in the, name of, in the name of love and care is, and how quotidian sacrifice remains for the most part, silenced in speech, but demonstrated in action. Competence and incompetence are simultaneously imminent and imminent in social life, bringing into relief the moral economy and politics of care at home, where market constraints form a mostly silenced but not invisible template for what actions seem possible, possible and desirable. Here, privatization is not an option. Life is social and fraught to the core. In the rest of the book, I continue to show how participants navigate these sorts of dilemmas and conflicts, sometimes choosing silence, other times gossip, to make claims of one another in an ethically fraught relational world. Again and again, we can see cultural patterns through attention to the minutia of language and interaction, which color and even constitute the ways in which families and communities struggle to cohere. And these reveal, again, the old feminist insight that public ethics are to be found in the after all not so private domain of families always already political home lives. Contrary to those who want to see ethics as a transcendent domain beyond the ordinary, I insist that it's in the imminent and imminent knots of mundane life that ethics appear and are worked out. The conclusion of my book, Mourning in Silent Sacrifice, reflects on the death and funeral preparations of another family, where we see how the bereaved attempt to contain the, their grief. Here too, I argue that repetition, like change, doesn't always beget futurity or natality in Hannah Arendt's terms, even in Vietnamese, where he said sacrifice literally means life and suffering in, in silence for the sake of, of love. Of course, not all places insist, as people tend to do in Vietnam, that sacrifice ought to be mute and, and secretive. 
silence here becomes salient as a present absence of speech, not unlike how Baz Ba was a present absence. Nearing death, she was almost but not quite like the ancestors whose altar continually reminds us of their absent presence as they exist palpably for their worshipers. Family-centered ethnographies and attention to side-shattering narratives, I think, help us understand community dynamics from the bottom up with their many conflicts and contradictions. In witnessing the open-endedness and ambiguity over which family configuration, ethical aspirations, or set of perspectives to privilege, and asking who really is a virtuous victim or moral pawn, who belongs in the family or community and on what grounds, for whom relatives or institutions are responsible and in what ways, we can initiate similar discussions at the larger scale levels of public institutions, such as medicine, law, and public welfare that overlap with, but don't fully encompass family relations. In the US, calls for freedom often imply a liberal negative type of freedom premised on monadic, bounded, autonomous individuals who insist on freedom to neglect and abandon and cut off connections. But relationships and obligations are in fact inescapable and need not inherently be experienced as coercive and harmful, though they often can be unevenly and inequitably distributed, such that the ideal of asymmetrical reciprocity in practice, and especially at larger scales, can easily slip into relations of exploitation and subjugation. Still, stasis in present relations is not inevitable but simulated and achieved. Our historical baggage of racism, disenfranchisement, and liberal conceptualizations of personhood, as Marx noted long ago and countless followers have shown, leave far too many community members vulnerable, dehumanized, and subject to social death. I've yet to see an all-encompassing solution, nor do I have the hubris to think that I can formulate it. And so the challenge remains to imagine and forge a better world in which care in its asymmetrically reciprocal and everyday sacrificial forms might yet, be intersub might yet be an intersubjective force of good and sadly, sometimes and for some, also for harm. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna turn it over now to, um, to Joao. Great. First of all, I want to give a warm thanks to Mirav for sharing her work, past and present, with us this evening, as well as Christina Baines, Stephanie Roop, and Baird Campbell for helping to organize this event. That we live in worlds on edge has served as a premise for much of the past decades of anthropology, in which inequality, violence, and uncertainty have been so proximate to social lives, exhausted for sure, but are still harboring visions and surprising scapes. Anxiety and anomie have been deeply felt on the edges of autocracy and predatory capitalism, of disintegrated cultures and forced migration, infrastructural breakdown and abrupt climate change, mediated by extreme populism, war, disinformation, and state and corporate efforts to dismantle piecemeal, though meaningful, agendas of socioeconomic rights. Meanwhile, as Mirav so powerfully conveys in her work, the ethnographic sensorium has also kept eliciting people's plasticity and desires for care and for things to be otherwise. What then does the present moment ask of anthropology, of our listening and ways of knowing and of our own responsibility towards practical solidarity in the face of so much that is on edge. How do we write about these times and thus take a leap towards interfering in their course, a tentative both to the massive scale of vulnerability, affliction and death that has come into view, but also to the active will to create community and emergent forms of resistance and politics therein? As we heard from Arav, alternative practices of being human and of conviviality emerge alongside newfangled scales of harm and caregiving. People the world over are propelled by a continued state of urgency into rethinking 
the architectures and assumptions of medical capitalism, political power, and economic and communal life. And we too are thrust into rethinking our disciplinary bequest, research foci, and public roles as scholars. As we ponder over what and who needs our work, we must appraise with humility anthropology's origins and entanglements in colonialism, environmental imperialism, and racism. But we will, must also maintain a commitment to the empirical potentials that interlocution opens up and to learning from human ingenuities in the face of death in all its forms. For the discipline keeps striving from relational and situated knowledge making, as we heard tonight, that destabilizes hierarchies of expertise, from historically attuned analysis and an openness to insurgent archives, and from reflexive engagement as diverse practitioners seek to unsettle hierarchies in the category of the human and politicize ethical thought, all things that Marav so generatively does. Her ethnography and writing continually reminds us that intimate practices of care entrenched often in the ordinary linguistic and interpersonal practices of sacrifice within kin communities are key modalities by which we can understand the effects of larger sociopolitical crises, as well as how people strive for an ethical world making beyond their present limitations. This argument is crystallized in Marav's brilliant first book, Silence and Sacrifice, which uses medical, psychological, and linguistic anthropological tools to interrogate how domestic sacrifices, as we heard tonight, intricately inflected by gender, age, class, and political hierarchies, open onto intergenerational worlds of pain and struggle in the midst of imperialism, war, and political economic change. But as bits of Mirav's discussion have already suggested, the implications of her work outstretch her original ethnographic focus on Vietnam. From the health costs of conflicts in Ukraine and Israel-Palestine to the racialized inequalities in a COVID-19 stricken United States, it seems that these few years we have in this that these few years we have witnessed some of the most shocking retractions of state and public health resources, and the rise of an economic rationality that prioritizes the market and the inequalities it reproduces. In this light, Mirab's work in Vietnam, in Israel, and the U.S. Poverty re powerfully reminds us that people always challenge and devise new ethical terms for their lives in the midst of these conditions. Not always liberatory, not necessarily immediately beneficial, these ordinary ethics produced within kin communities seem to allow people to process the immense sacrifices that must be made to keep loved ones alive. Sacrifice then becomes an ethical and relational tool that anthropologists, as well as our interlocutors can use to make critiques of the state and of each other as they struggle to survive and flourish within damaged political and economic landscapes. One immediately compelling aspect of your work, Marav, and I have a few questions for you, is your eclectic methodological approach. In both silence and sacrifice and your newer work, we see reflected your commendable training in multiple subfields of anthropology and your commitment to various dimensions of people's existences. Namely, you draw on medical and psychological anthropologists' emphasis on the dynamics of giving and receiving care in order to theorize how gender, age, class, and national politics contour experiences of life, illness, and death in Vietnam. At the same time, you work ethnographically with an emphasis on language. You're very skilled at tracing the silences and speech acts that constitute family care in Vietnam, and you theorize a number of linguistically-based patterns that your interlocutors use to carry out these ethical transactions. For example, foreshadowing, backshadowing, and side shadowing, as, as you discussed in your lecture, to ground care and ethics in political, historical, and spiritual events of the past and present, 
or asymmetrical reciprocity as an organizing principle of life connecting ancestral, family, and estate relationships. Can you speak a little bit more about what linguistic anthropology affords in your research? What might medical anthropologists, public health practitioners, and social scientists at large uniquely gain from this focus on language, communication, and silence? So that's my first big question. I really enjoyed your insistence at the end of your talk on what you call old feminist insight that public ethics are to be found in the after all not so private domain of families always already political home lives. Your rich work with interlocutors and the silencing of their sacrifice for elderlies, re elders reveals how, for example, young and poor women's home lives are impacted by imperialism and national change as they bear the brunt of care and thus become the containers of the effects of politics and histories. In your work, did these interlocutors find alternative spaces outside of the home or the public sphere to enact other kinds of relationships to the past and present? In other words, what is the role of history in their lives? Are they always linguistically and socially enmeshed in its consequences? Or are they able to transcend its confines? And uh, my third comment and question, uh, together with Vincent Adams, I have a forthcoming book titled Arc of Interference, Medical Anthropology for Worlds on Edge, in which we argue that medical anthropology's critical contribution to today's political economic rationalities lies in its abilities to move beyond intervention, signifying a one-off mode of technical fixes for supposedly isolated humanitarian or public health issues, and instead ground us in a mode of what we call interference, breaking open the common sense assumptions about health, the political economic interests that sustain the bare minimum, and empowering us with the comprehensive social science tools for an enlarged sense of justice. Your work powerfully provides a model for this interference as you do not place blame on any of Vietnam's policies or historical events, communism, market reforms, imperial war, but instead show how the fate of the families you worked with is dictated by gender, class, and other hierarchies that persist in ordinary realms, both because of and beyond macro-political events. Can you speak a little bit to what your ethnographic interference lend us moving forward? How do you think your interlocutors or other actors will be able to use your insight to advance their lives and visions differently? Again, Thank you for your work. And I really look forward to your comments and also to the questions that will come from the audience. Um, so thank you so much um, for such um, big questions and, um, and really complimentary remarks. Um, that my answers to this are, are actually interrelated in the sense that in some ways I have to disappoint everyone right like I, I don't I don't have easy solutions I don't have easy answers and I think that that's one of the things that my work shows best is that when we think we have um, a very certain agenda of how to change the world we are not always thinking of the various stakeholders that are involved, the various dynamics that are involved. And I do think that in that sense, interference is, is, um, is a really useful concept in that um, it allows us to, to maybe think, okay, we have a responsibility to make change while also acknowledging that we can't solve everything all at once. And part of it is, I think, also really this attention to language. 
and the ways that language is not just the words that are being spoken explicitly. It's also all of the dynamics of communication that are involved that help us see who is getting silenced, who is taking speaking rights, for example, who um, is creating certain hegemonies and how. Um, and I think that in that sense, also you ask if, if there are spaces kind of beyond public spaces and beyond the home, I don't know. I mean, can we be suspended outside of life? I don't know that we can transcend the conditions in which we live. Um, I actually think Marx is pretty right in saying that um, men and obviously also women make history, but history also makes us. And in that sense, um, people in Vietnam, like, of course, some of it has to do with the responses that people have to their conditions. And I think that that's something that we can get at through a, clo a close ethnographic lens. It's not just that conditions over-determine us, although they do, but it's also how do we act in the face of repression and subjugation. And also to, to really reframe the question of what it means to be a human being and not to think of it as being this autonomous individual who can act without being already always embodying um, and having inside them residing the lives of others. Um, and these can be connections that are more explicit or less explicit, but we carry our ancestors within us. And I think in Vietnam, it becomes more salient um, that relations are not just one direction. When we have parents caring for children, we also have children caring for parents. When we have structures of inequality that get reproduced, it doesn't just have, they don't just live on their own. It's also because we're co continuously colluding with these structures to reproduce them. And so I think that an attention, instead of in a lot of times in medical, psychological, cultural anthropology, oftentimes discourse is presented as an opposition to affect or to sentiment or to embodiment. And what I'd like to make the case for is, is that these two are inherently intertwined. And, and um, Eleanor Oakes is here in the audience and um, her piece, Experiencing Language, I think really well articulates the ways in which language really constitutes our experience. It's not just some domain that's outside of us. It's, it's in the process of speaking, of interacting, of crying, of praying, of doing, an, of staying silent, that we also come to feel and embody those, those relations and, and those feelings. Um, and so in being able to attend to, to these phenomena and also being able to attend not just to the content of stories, to the content of discourses, but to how they unfold over time that I think we get a better, although always impartial and incomplete sense of what's going on and why do certain power relations persist and how and what are some spaces to change them. And, and I think that that has to do also with my imagining of flourishing as um, acting not as a kind of resistance, but acting within but testing the limits, the rigidity of certain structures and, and finding spaces to make them more elastic. Um, and, and, and I think that, for example, Sarah Willen's idea of inhabitable spaces of welcome is a useful concept. Um, instead of thinking always of the home as a safe place, because home isn't always a safe place for everybody. Um, and, and I think that when we wish to transcend relations, it's, it's a kind of trying to be outside ourselves, but in fact, we're always already with ourselves.
Um, so I think I'm rambling a bit and, and maybe I should, I should um, let other questions kind of help me clarify what I'm saying. Wonderful. So Christina, do you have some questions? If not, I have a follow-up question for Raf. Sure, why don't you, um, we do have one hand raised. Um, Katie Ko, would you like to unmute? Yes, hi, um, I really enjoyed your book um, and also your talk. I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about side shadowing. And I guess I'm a little unclear on its significance and maybe it speaks to what you've just been saying just now, but so the, it, it, you talk about it's kind of fragmented, ambivalent, nonlinear quality. This seems linked to the fact that it's not part of hegemonic discourse. Um, so that it is maybe a space for imagining new kinds of relations. And yet uh, in some ways, the particular example that you use is very much, um, I don't know. I, so I'm just wondering about that. And then the other, perhaps thinking about the, you know, how what is said and what can be said is linked to feeling. I, I don't know. Is that, you know, is that what's significant about this? Um, is this a, is that, is that fragmented nonlinear speech a way of reimagining um, these relations? Or is it just to know that there is a kind of a, there's their, uh, the, um, the, the harmony, right? And I don't want to call it a surface harmony, but because that would be uh, denigrating that harmony or kind of giving it a lower status, but there's that harmony and then there's conflict behind. So I just, I'm wondering how, yeah, what kind of value you put on that side shadowing, um, partly because I'm thinking, well, how, how might I see it and what might I use with, uh, from that concept? Oh, thank you for that question. So um, in thinking about side shadowing, it is um, a narrative practice, meaning that exactly as you said, it, it does capture that ambiguity, fragmentation and everything. But also I think what it allows us to do is see how people both orient to the future, but also the past. And so we're familiar, I think, with um, subjunct subjectivity and subjunctive narratives, which tend to look at the future as open-ended. What I do with side shadowing is suggest that it's not just, narratives are not just accounts of the past or um, imaginings of the future. They, they can do both and, and we constantly engage in both. And I think that as soon as we think of language not as referential, but as constitutive of our world, language doesn't just help us see what is out there, it also is creating these realities, um, then we are able to be more fluid and flexible. And I don't think that side shadowing is a panacea, by the way. Um, some of my work, for example, with anorexia and attempts at recovery shows um, rather that in telling side shadowing narratives, you can kind of remain stuck and, and not settling on a coherent kind of story of what it means to be well. And, and I think that as far as activism goes, a lot of times we need to embrace much more coherent kind of forward moving narratives, discourses, visions of what the future might be. And side shadowing can, can kind of get in the way and it vexes us. But I think that what it also does is in vexing us, it also shows us where's, where are the blind spots? Where are those possibilities that um, can extend both to what might have been, what could have been, and what could be, what could still be? And that, I think, opens up the possibilities while not having us put on the kind of very clear um, blinders to where we're going and where we've been. Does that kind of get explained? That? Um, and, and so I think that side shattering narratives, again, they're not totalizing. And I think people and movements 
can at one time express side shadowing and at other times back shadowing and at other times foreshadowing. And in fact, we saw that in the case that I presented and that's really on the micro scale, but it also happens um, in everyday interaction and certainly in medicine um, and particularly in mental health, for example. Like how is it that patients are enjoined to be better and to fight the disease and everything, right? Um, what happens when people are not necessarily on board with the structures of healing that they're supposed to embrace? What happens when people do not um, align exactly with the so-called helpers and carers? And, and this is where we see friction. And I, and I think that side shadowing is especially good at helping us see some of these frictions. Thank you. Yes. See Ellie? Thank you. Yes, Eleanor um, also has a question. I invite you to unmute. Hi, thanks so much, Marav. It's nice to hear some of these themes also reverberating in your, your more recent research and widening up some of your generalizations um, beyond Da Nang and it's so, so fascinating. What, while you were um, talking and also during the discussion by Zhao Bil, uh, um, I kept on thinking about theory of mind research in psychology or, and in philosophy like Daniel Dennett and how that is so individualized but it has been taken up in some of the work on in the ethical turn in anthropology. Um, and I was thinking that, um, that your work can actually speak to some of the limitations of the theory of mind paradigm in the sense that, I mean, this idea about public ethics, that, that there's, there's some there's theory of mind, you know, especially, for example, in the counter narrative that you um, played for us, that about what someone should be thinking, or ex what I'm expected to think other people would be thinking of of, of me of them you know, of me with them towards them and so on, or what that person should have been thinking about with respect to me or my sister or you know the wife or this or that or the mother-in-law or things like that so there there are all sorts of modalities of public ethical um, perspective taking um, that is really incredibly complicated um, that is also some of these si how side shadowing fits into theory of mind too, that you have this, you know, these modalities that are operating all at once while we're trying to figure out, you know, how to engage with one another, you know, in this social scene. So I'm gonna stop here. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that perhaps some, some of the theory of mind tends to assume this kind of linear one-to-one -one correspondence. If you only knew this, or, or if you can put yourself in somebody else's shoes, and I think that that's a kind of impoverished view of how, um, how our mind works, um, and that our mind is not this kind of disembodied, ahistorical space. Um, but that instead we have these multiple resonances um, that are inflected by our senses, by the associations that we have. And so I, I think that in some ways scientists know that the brain is really complex, but also if our subjectivity doesn't just lie in the brain because our brain is also connected to our body, then to think of mind as conflatable with a brain and to think that if you can just enter somebody's mind imaginatively, then you would be on board or then you have empathy um, is a somewhat problematic way of approaching interactions and relations. 
And so I think that again, part, part of what I began with is the ways that we are relational in all senses of the world and, and we are responding to and interacting with others um, and to others. Um, and so I, again, I'm, I'm rambling a bit and I feel like I'm, I'm repeating myself but some of this, for example, I have also in my book, um, a case of a woman whose neighbor's son died of AIDS. Um, and she tells again, this very side shattering story of, um, you know, was he polluted morally? Yes. Um, but do, is she going to pay respect to the mother? Yes. Um, are her brothers going to carry out his hopes? No. Is his body infectious? Yes and no, because there is a kind of conflation between the body is infectious versus the body more metaphorically. Um, and, 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 then, and, and in that way, she also parts ways with a kind of public ethics in Vietnam about AIDS is a social evil. Prostitution is a social evil. Drug use is a social evil. And this family had all three of them. And so you would think that if she were to align with public ethics, she wouldn't have anything to do with them. But that's not how relations work in practice. Um, people align and disalign at different times um, and in relation to the contextual situation. And I think that that's also what I saw in terms of morality in Vietnam is that people don't operate by just one governing principle that trumps everything else. Context always matters. And, and I think in that way, they're very anthropological, I guess. So maybe that's a long-winded way of saying I agree with you. Thank you so much for that. Oh, we do have uh, Marjorie Goodman. She was um, one of our previous speakers in the series. Um, Marjorie, did you, oh, did you? Uh, I just, <clears throat> thank you so much for this very beautiful presentation on so many levels. I wonder if you could talk just a little bit, you talked about uh, a moral economy of silence and gossip as an alternative. So can you talk a little bit about how you see that working? Sure. Um, so a lot of times I think that, um, thank you, by the way, um, a, a lot of times people, you know, the, the value um, in this community is to not call attention to your own suffering. Um, and yet there is ways in which they criticize others and gossip about others to call attention to some of the ways in which they are taking on disproportional burdens, for example, or they're taking on burdens, period. Um, and gossip can be a kind of indirect way that's relatively silent and yet also very much an, an, a speech act, right, of making moral claims about one another and making more moral claims of each other. And this was another place in which I saw women um, oftentimes instead of, for example, uniting together um, and maybe transcending um, the, the kind of inequalities that they face. A lot of times the, the criticisms come from them about each other and they end up upholding the men who are doing a lot less than them. Um, and, and, and that's where some of those moral economies happen is, is that there are certain norms about what a virtuous feminine person is and what is a virtuous person in general, right? So if you're being filial, if you're being caring, if you're being um, responsive to other family members. Um, and of course, men and women do that, right? Um, but there are different ways in which who has to silence themselves more um, and who gets gossiped about more um, intersects 
precisely with these vectors of hierarchy. Um, and, and, and so I, I guess that that's some of what I'm getting at it is these um, economies of who has rights of speaking and when, um, and, and who gets praised and who gets condemned um, both behind their backs and to their faces. And I think we, we see similar things here, right? Like um, certain victims are elevated in certain ways and others just are really not. Um, and, and this has to do with the ways we, we talk about people, which again is why language is so important. Um, it's not just a peripheral kind of epiphenomenon. It's something that, that really creates who is being um, constituted as bad or good or something in between. I think we have time for one more question. Zhao, would you like to pose the final question? Yes, yes. So, so um, I was I was very moved by the by the short films and the images that you that you showed, and um, and I was drawn to the materiality, the physicality of the house. And um, in your responses, you said um, we are relations but it seems that the houses were relational there. That first short film at the threshold of one house open to another house. So houses were kind of open space. They were relational themselves, right? And then the second film, the house was rearranged, you know, to, to make space for the care, the house, so the living room became the bedroom you know, the home or hospital, so to speak. And I, so I wonder if now going back to your field work and now revisiting these materials, the films, does something that the house does on people. And I say this thinking of Levi-Strauss idea of house societies and the house as a moral person. Does the house act on kinship? Does the house act on personhood. I'm so glad you picked up on that because absolutely. And I think that's maybe one of the themes I developed less or maybe didn't develop at all in my book, but it's absolutely there. Um, so houses, one of the things that was striking also is how similarly arranged they are, whether it was a poor family or a rich family there was always the place to receive guests in the front and the furniture was extremely similar no matter what. And the, re the arrangement of kind of the two seats and the bench and the table in between. Um, and, and that was a formal way of receiving. And the kitchen was always in the back and the altar is always the uppermost level. Um, and you devote a room to it, even though you might be a, an extremely crowded house. There is always that. So, so houses do absolutely structure relations of who is being in the front and who is in the back and who is upstairs and who is sleeping with whom and who is sitting and who is looking in. And so even though they were renovating houses, some of those structural principles absolutely were reinforced and repeated again and again. And, um, and like you said, also the fact that houses and streets are so close to each other, you can look in and, and you can hear everything that's going on. And that is absolutely structuring some of the possibilities of, of who is relating to whom. And are you gonna be shouting? Are you gonna be um, speaking softly? Um, and, and there is, again, that sense of, there is a constant kind of audience, including the house itself. And the house is, is also, um, is housing the spirit of the ancestors. And, and it's also, it's the obligations to the ancestors that then demands heteronormative um, marriage, for example, to create kids who are gonna create um, people who are gonna worship you and, and who are gonna owe to the ancestors. And so I think it's, it's a theme that I didn't develop as much in this talk but um, definitely the materiality of it is really important. And I did analyze it to some extent, even in the management of death um, in an article, it's not in the book, um, the ways that funerary inscriptions, for example, outside the home versus inside the home 
are very different um, in, in the ways that outside they construct the vision of a citizen to be mourned. And that's a temporary relation. And inside the home, and this, is, this has to do with their linguistic codes, they, use, they construct the person as, as, um, as, an, as a relative, as a kin with enduring relations um, that really have to do with the materiality and of, of all the semiotic kind of forces within there, the, what I call qualia. Of the, of the object. So it's not just the house, but also the range of material objects inside and outside of the house that both create hierarchy and also historicize people and create that kind of sense of historicity. And I did see um, there was one more question from, from Yume. Yes. And Thank you very much, if I may. Um, so thank you for your wonderful and, um, as Candy said, beautiful talk. So um, my question is actually uh, very related to uh, Professor Feather Bios uh, on the materiality. I saw in your um, talk that you mentioned about money, that uh, people um, mentioned about how much money they asked for. So, it, Actually, it's, it's the same how this uh, materiality uh, was really playing out and also was integrated and uh, in this, for example, language socialization and in their everyday interactions with their family and within the community. I wanted to hear more, but I was glad that you talked about the house, the uh, physicality of that, that partially already solved uh, some of my questions. But if you could talk a little bit more on the money or how they are really interplayed with the interaction would be great. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, um, thank you for that question too. Um, and and I, I did want to just go back to, to one thing I forgot to mention in response to Chao, which is that, um, yeah, absolutely. They, they rearranged the house for, for the um, old woman, right? That, that the TV used to be there and instead they put her bed, which used to be in the bedroom, um, in, in the middle of, of the living room to, to not forget the sick and the dead and, um, or not the dead, the sick, um, to, to not kind of shy away from, from illness. Um, but as far as money, and this has to do again with relations of care, money isn't seen as dirty in the ways that we tend to think of it. People are quite comfortable asking you, how much money do you make? Um, and expecting you to, to have an answer because this has a way of gauging how much can you give, right? Um, and, and the expectation is, is that if you have more means, then you give more, you, you take care of people. And, and so in the same ways that the language socialization, there, there's, that this, is, this has to do with the bi-directionality of care that part of the yielding, part of the giving is in fact uh, a way of redistributing resources instead of our accumulationist perspective under capitalism, which is just whoever has the most is gonna accrue more and more and more at the expense of others. Um, here, the logic is different. It is a logic of, of distributing. And at the same time, I don't wanna romanticize it because the reality is, is that a lot of times gifts also flow upwards so that powerful families do become more powerful. They get more resources. And if they're really kind of good about it and, and enacting asymmetrical reciprocity properly, then they also redistribute and they provide for the poor and the sick and, and the relatives. But this has to do also with connections with kin and with care. And, and that's why I'm saying it's a kind of dual edge sword, um, the, the notion of, of asymmetrical reciprocity because it works great when both sides are able to think of obligations as mutual but unequal. But in practice, that's not always the case. And especially when, when we move it to larger scales of institutions. Does that get at what you're asking? Yes, thank you very much. So um, 
Thank you very, very much. Um, we are coming to a close, but we would like to thank you on behalf of the board of um, the New York Academy of Sciences Anthropology Division to Marav Shohat and Zhao Biel for your very, very um, scintillating talk and comments. And I think that, that this was um, such an appropriate and, and a wonderful way to end our series on care and community because not only um, did we hear about um, the particulars of care, but also how anthropology as a discipline um, can offer us insights into care, but also insights into the, the complexities and possibilities of, the, of care in the future. So um, I really thank you for closing us out. Um, and thank you all for being here um, in May um, to the very end. I would like to just, um, tell you about our series for next year, for the next academic year. Our first talk will be in September. Um, our new theme, um, which I think follows from the theme of care and community um, in a way that, that makes sense, um, is crises, past upheavals, current conjectures, and the future forward. So the Distinguished Lecture Series for the 2022-23 explores how anthropology illuminates our understandings of and engagements with contemporary crises. Welcoming scholars from the four fields of anthropology, we address the notion that crisis may not always have been a common shared human experience, suggesting that anthropology can shed light on the way people have understood and resolved past and present crises. Analysis that might help us find a way forward. Sometimes change occurs, occurs incrementally, allowing strong continuities to reinforce age old patterns. Other times transformation arrives abruptly, bringing disruption and destruction, as well as opportunities for resilience and rebuilding in the aftermath of crisis. How have humans sought to move forward from crisis? Finding despite the rubble, opportunities to rebuild structures of um, society, polity, health, and well being. Humans have developed our modern physical forms during the climatic crisis of the ice ages. Languages similarly often reflect crises and ruptures in ecological and social relationships. Archaeologists note dramatic shifts in human settlement, technology, and adaptation at moments of intense challenge, collapse, and catastrophe. Cultural anthropologists examine how people experience and respond to natural events, plagues, wars, and political revolutions. Um, paradigmatic shifts in ideologies concerning sacred and social relations, impacting minor and major transformations in social patterns of life. Human and non-human beings alike face the necessity of making decisions and choosing pathways in contexts of ongoing crises in the form of pandemics, fires, and floods, among many others. And even as people develop new technologies to alleviate such moments of crisis, we simultaneously suffer unexpected repercussions of these same technologies, including worries about the surveillance state and abuses of social media. As a result, we are also witnessing a crisis of truth and trust. What some people perceive to be truth, others dismiss as conspiracy. Some, people, some feel we have lost common notions of solidarity, while others seek recognitions of the ways that we have long been divided. Capitalist systems of production foment differences between classes of people who benefit or suffer from this acceleration of inequalities. And at the same time, the sustainability of our planetary ecosystems is being eroded. Almost finished. Our 2022-2023 lecture series builds on the work of recently deceased distinguished colleague, Dr. Paul Farmer, who stated, the idea that some lives matter less is the root of all that's wrong with the world. We invite speakers and our global audience to contemplate his words and to use anthropological theory, research, and perspectives to examine what factors contribute to the contemporary confluence of crises and to propose paths forward to achieve a more just, equitable, and stable future. So I hope that you will all join us in September um, to begin thinking um, about um, crises. And um, I, I thank you again for all for coming tonight. Thanks again to Marav and Zhao for um, really kind of bridging, ending care and community and bridging us into these, this, um, this, this discussion and thinking around crises that will lead our, our next series.